So come on, bro. If you would, give a big, giant, mountain home call to my brother Jimmy and Sherry Bratcher. Good morning. I'm getting situated. This is situated. It is. I'm glad to be here. It's such an honor to uh, be hanging out in Mountain Home. Yes. I've been coming to Mountain Home since 1981, yeah. my first trip. I sang at Three Brothers Church. We drove down from Kansas City in 1981, sang at Three Brothers, and turned around and went home. <laughs> I'll never forget it. It was a good thing. Hang on, I need to make an adjustment over here. Are you happy? Yes. Yeah. All right. You're crowded in here like a bunch of sardines. A couple of chairs left. Well, I made up my mind before I get home. Gonna leave behind all that I came from. Leaving my things out on the front porch. Tonight I'm checking my blues at the door Forget about everything that happened this week Take a little time for just you and me Forget about the mortgage, forget about the bills Tonight there'll be no blues around here Check your blues at the door 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 So kick back, relax Cause we're checking our blues at the door All that worry, baby, all that stress Won't make much difference in any way With all we got, you know, we're so blessed so kick back and enjoy this mess Check your blues at the door 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 And kick back, relax Cause we're checking our blues at the door Oh, if I had the wealth of the world I wouldn't trade for the love I have with you, girl Through bad times, we've always made it through So from here on out, I'm checking my blues crazy world how many of you looking forward to Wednesday (laughs) 
Well, on Fourth of July weekend, I was in Asheville, North Carolina, at a church, and the worship team was being lazy, and they called me and said, "You can do all the patriotic music for the Fourth of July." And I'm like, "Oh boy!" And uh, so I landed. I, I, you know, started thinking through patriotic songs. And I thought, "I'm gonna sing God Bless America." And uh, so on the flight on the way out there, I thought, you know what? I think I'll look and see if there's maybe more to the song God Bless America than we know. Some of you really old timers will remember Kate Smith. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, uh, but this song was written in 1918 by Irving Berlin. But it didn't become popular until 1938, right at the beginning of World War II. In 1938, Adolf Hitler was Time Magazine's Man of the Year. Which I used to say, now that's why you shouldn't trust the media. But they put, you know, they put controversial figures on there as well, so I can't completely bash it. But you shouldn't trust the media. So anyway. And what I found when I looked was I found that there was an introduction to this song that I wasn't aware of, and it reveals the purpose of why Irving Berlin wrote it. And um, it's a declaration that all of us should be declaring over our nation. And so I want to sing it to you. While the storm clouds gather across the sea, let us swear our allegiance to a land that is free. Let us all be thankful for a land so fair. As we lift our voices in this solemn prayer. You didn't know it was a prayer, did you? God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her. And guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans, white with foam. God bless America. My home, sweet home, God bless America, my home, sweet home. Let's sing it one more time. God bless America, the land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains to the prairie. America 
Thank you so much. Sherry and I just spent two days, um, I'm trying to remember the dates, just a, it, was, it wasn't last week, it was the week before last, um, at Walter Reed Hospital in uh, Washington, D.C., spending time with our wounded heroes that were there, and it was amazing. It was amazing because um, they, um, they just had such an attitude. First man we met, was his name is Mike, he was about... He's about this high. Had both his legs blown off from an IED. Had over 130 plus surgeries. And his attitude was, I'm ready to go back. I'm ready to go fight. And uh, we live in a great place with great people. And we need not let our media and anything else overshadow that. And we need to continue to fight for the greatness that we have. Because he 
first loved me because he first loved me I like singing about Jesus I like talking about Jesus I like experiencing Jesus Y'all doing all right? Are you going to heaven? You know we're going for dinner, right? That's that's all we're going for is dinner. And then we're coming back. And you know what the food's going to be, right? Bar barbecue. I can prove it in the scripture. I can prove it. I can prove it. How? That's what all those burnt offerings are about back in the Old Testament. God likes burning meat. Some of you have to leave your pork at home, though. That's what I'm talking about right there. So when we get there, it's going to be a good time. But we might as well start now because we got all heaven's got to give us in Jesus, right? We got the best there is. party you can lose your blues you're invited but don't hesitate it's on main street by the pearly gate well there's a party going on well there's a party going on well there's a party going on and you ought to come along it's around the throne of god you can stand by the rock if your name's on the roll Sing about the greatest story that's ever been told Say stand up, don't sit down Because all God's children be dancing round Well there's a party going on Well there's a party going on Well there's a party going on And you ought to come along It's Around the throne of God Everybody scream Everybody dance Go Sherry Well there's a party going on Well there's a party going on well, there's a party going on, and you ought to come along. It's around the throne of God. Well, how about you? You gonna come? You better talk to Jesus. He's the one. He's got an invitation with your name on it, and there's a place, there's a table for you to sit. Well, there's a party going on. Well, there's a party going on. Well, there's a party going on, and you ought to come along. There's a party going on, and you gotta come along. There's a party going on, and it's up around the throne of God. Yeah. Oh. 
Am I supposed to use this microphone? To... Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's all right right there. Thank you, thank you so much. Well, we're, like I said before, I'm honored to be here. Sherry is with me. Yeah. Sherry. We're going to celebrate our 40th consecutive year of marriage. Uninterrupted, uninterrupted, our 40th uninterrupted year of marriage, so... Those of you that know us know that we were married once and divorced, and my grandmother paid for our first divorce. Can you know your marriage is jacked up when Granny pays for your divorce? That's what I'm saying. And uh, so we're going to celebrate that December 19th. Eric said we need fifty thousand dollars. The reason we need fifty thousand dollars is our van that we travel in, the White Pearl. Have you ever heard about the White Pearl? White Pearl is a legendary van, has its own t-shirts, everything. The White Pearl is considered to be one of the foremost white trash treasure pieces in the world. <laughs> it's really serious. And uh, one of my friends came to me, pastor friend, and he said, Jimmy, you have to replace this van. And uh, one of our friends, our, our good friend Mark Gunger, who plays in my band sometimes and mark's a if you don't know mark's ministry you should look him up online he has a thing called laugh your way to a better marriage and um but mark was with us on a prison tour we did last june and and mark's mark's comment on the van was he said every time we start this up i feel like we're tempting god <laughs> so so we're having a farewell party to the white pearl for the white pearl on november 18th at antioch church in overland park and and that's the beginning of a fundraiser for us to kick off to try to raise the money that's necessary for us to replace it with something that uh, will be our full-time travel vehicle. Our, the Pearl has 210,000 miles on it. Before we had the Pearl, we traveled in our truck, our, our Ford F-150, which has 338,000 miles on it. It's a Harley truck. And... Uh, and in our car, we just bought our car. It's got 80,000 miles on it now, so we're needing a vehicle to do that kind of thing. But we do have uh, music and teaching CDs back there. If you're not familiar with us, if you haven't read my book, it's back there. It's called Don't Take Your Dreams to the Gray. I have a teaching series that Eric likes back there. He bought it for Andrea, and she threw it at him. And uh, it's called You're Not the Boss of Me. And one of the greatest questions that you'll ever answer in your relationship is, who's in control? And until you answer that, you'll always have conflict. You'll always have struggle. you give those away, I'll pay for it. Okay. So who would like to have this? I would. You would? Yes. You would? Okay, here. Give it to her. Okay. Look at that. I'll give you the next one. How's that? Here you go. There's another relationship series back there called The Marriage of Your Dreams. So I just got married this year. You did? This is a this is like a really it's like the best teaching like in depth Bible teaching on marriage, period. Not just because I've done it, but because we just spent Sherry and I spent years uh, ministering to families, couples, and so that's kind of the culmination of all the research that we did. Uh, Dream Acceleration, I'm actually going to preach on this today, and uh, come get it. And uh, and so you'll get a full taste of what that's like. Mm -hmm. My uh, Secretly Famous CD, Secretly Famous was our missions project to Blues Radio, so we released this around the world. Okay. We had radio play in... Uh, in 120 countries around the world so come get come, yeah come get it you were the first one i saw so and then finally my my exchange cd not finally i still have my book my exchange cd we released this in 2010 it's the most devotional cd that i've ever done did you want this you did get, go get her go get her one share here you go come here uh-huh exchange yeah and in my book, who hasn't read my book? You gotta read it. Don't Take Your Dreams to the Grave. It's a book of encouragement. It's real easy to read. A lot of people read it in one setting. And um, so it's about encouraging ourselves to be ourselves because that's the most important thing that you can discover is who you are 
in Christ and show up in life. So this morning, I want to talk to you about dream acceleration. And I want to talk to you about dreams, and particularly about dream acceleration. You see, our worldview is from a very limited reality. We don't see things as they really are. We get into trouble when we think that we see things as they really are. It's part of the problem that we have in our world or in the church is that we think that we're right. Amen. And we are on the pursuit. You know, we've been made righteous, but being right is another thing. And when we think that we're right, we see the world from that view and we limit ourselves. So we live our life from a limited world view. We don't see things as they really are because only God is capable of seeing. The, only his, his view is the reality of it. And when we see things, we think we see things the way they really are, we'll live a very limited life. And here's why. Ephesians 3.20 says this, Now glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. So when we limit our reality to just what we think, we take God out of the equation because he is constantly leading us into situations and circumstances that are beyond our capability of comprehension. Amen. And I love those moments. Sometimes they're kind of scary, but I love those moments when all of a sudden you realize it's like you're in way over your head and God has led you into something that's by far more wonderful, by far greater than anything that you've ever experienced. It, you couldn't have described it because you wouldn't even have had the imagination to dream that there was anything that wonderful. When I think about things that are beyond my ability to comprehend, it's like I'm dreaming. Dreams are those dis divine insights from God. They encourage us that there's something better. They encourage us to risk and to do great things and to press it. I would take this up here if you want to. You guys want to set that up there? It'd be a little bit easier for me. Yes, it would. But there are those things that cause us just to press in. Man, that's big, ain't it? You built it that way. They cause us to get out of the boat and risk. I have this song called Get Out the Boat. I'm, gonna, I'm stepping out of my notes here. It's called Get Out the Boat. And it's about uh, the disciples and Jesus walking on the water. And uh, Peter, you know, he was the only one that got out of the boat. What about the 11 other guys? What was their deal? They're just kind of sitting around going, wow, this is wild. Well, I think we'll just sit here. And everybody criticizes Peter because he doubted and sank, but he walked out to Jesus. Jesus picked him up and he walked back. That's right. And every, every four years when I sing that song, people will come up to me and say, why are you singing that political song? I said, what are you talking about, that get out and vote song? Get out and vote. So don't be like the other 11 to just sit around and watch stuff happen. Get out and vote. There you go. One thing, you know, I get around people, Christians, you know, I've been, been a Christian for almost 40 years, right near 40 years I've been waiting to say that, and, uh, and I've been around some goofy Christians. Some of y'all resemble that statement. And I've been a goofy Christian. Come on, Ari, I've been sincere. I'm not criticizing anything that I haven't been. And, uh, but one way that you can qualify your dreams is this. Every dream that's from the Lord is about the family. Yes, sir. Every dream that's from the Lord is about the family. Amen. How can I say that? Because that's his dreams. Right. You walk outside, you look around, you experience creation. What's it all about? Why is it here? Because God wants a family. Because yes, God has a desire to be a father with a family. And you can always qualify your dreams by overlaying that on top of them and saying, how does this affect yes. my family? Yes. How is this going to affect the outcome of yes. it? And when I think about dreams, I always think about Joseph, the dreamer. You know about Joseph, he's the young man that had a dream. And we're going to pick it up, his story up in Genesis chapter 40, verse 8, if you want to turn there. Genesis 40, verse 8, verse 8, and we'll just sanctify this with the 
Sankify it. Sankify it. Some of you old timers remember Sanka. Well, sanctify it with the word. Genesis 40, verse 8. Joseph was a young man that had a dream and it caused him a lot of problems. In Genesis 40, verse 8, we find Joseph. Joseph's had this dream. It's caused him to be completely rejected by his family. It's, he's been abandoned, misunderstood by his father. His brothers have attempted to kill him. They eventually sold him into slavery. He finally got in trouble, got you know falsely accused, and now we find him at this verse in prison. So this is an inmate talking to you here. And it says this in Genesis 40, verse 8. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. It says, And they replied, We both had dreams last night, but no one can tell us what they mean. Interpreting dreams is God's business, Joseph replied. Go ahead and tell me your dreams. And whenever we read the Bible, we just kind of skim over stuff like that and we leave the emotional aspect and what the emotions were like at that moment. So here's a young man that has had nothing but problems since he got a dream. His life has fallen apart. It's a wreck. He finds himself completely abandoned by his family. He finds himself here in prison. And can you imagine how he felt when somebody showed up and said, hey, we had these dreams. I'm sure that his first response was, I don't want to hear about your dreams. Don't talk to me about dreams because of the pain in his own life that he had felt. But something incredible happened here in this verse. Through all of that adversity, through all of that pain, through every, all the misunderstanding and hurt, Joseph did something incredible. He simply said to these men, go ahead and tell me about your dreams. And from that moment on, Joseph's dreams began to suddenly and rapidly accelerate. He wasn't aware, but in burying his emotions and becoming interested in these men's dream, it was a catalyst to his own destiny. Because one of these men would be the one that remembered him after he was released from prison and announced him to the king of that country, which then brought him from the prison to the palace to the number two position in that entire region. All because of one thing. He was interested in somebody else's dream. The purpose of this message is that our dreams accelerate when we become interested in the dreams of other people. Our dreams accelerate when we become interested in the dreams of other people. It should be a key focus for us as kingdom people. It's the principle that Jesus laid down when he came to this planet. He set aside his own worth and value in heaven and came and became a man. And found, was, you know, I like the verse in Colossians where it says, and he being found in fashion as a man. He was fashionable. He enjoyed that, that fashion. He laid down his dream and became interested in your dream, in my dream. And he laid this principle down to us. And I understand we get all caught up in our own dreams. Man, I have this dream. I want to build this business. I want this for my family. I want, to, I want to create this. I want this ministry. I want all these things. And we put forth all of our effort, and we should. But we can't do it at the expense of not being interested in someone else's dream. Because that's the principle that Jesus gave us and demonstrated for us. We have to be interested in other people's dreams. It's the key focus for us as kingdom people. It's the main purpose of ministry is helping others find and fulfill those dreams. We're supposed to be interested in other people's dreams. So what are the dreams of other people? All of us have one dream. We have one dream. At the core of who we are, wired, hardwired into our DNA, we have this dream. We desire to experience the love of the family. 
We desire more than anything. You can go through the most awful relationships ever. You can have the worst marriage in the world. And immediately, as soon as that's over and you're healed up, you're right back in pursuit of the same thing. Why? Because we desire to be connected. We desire to experience the love of the family. And we are to be those that are out helping people when they look to us to interpret their dreams, to connect them to this wonderful family that we have. With a father who in, there is no dysfunction, who is perfect. With an elder brother who sacrificed everything that he had to prove his love for us. To a church family who is growing and understanding and experiencing life together. People long for those things. So how do we assist people when they come to us and ask for us to help them interpret their dreams? We use our gift. We use our gift. I'm going to read out of Proverbs 18, 16. And I'm going to read several translations here so that we kind of come at this point from all different directions. Because this is so important. We use our gift. Proverbs 18, 16 in the New King James. It says this. I'm glad you all actually have Bibles. Because I'm an advocate for an add-on to our Bible apps on our smartphones that sounds like pages turning. Because <laughs> that way then you'll know how to, I'll know how to read. Proverbs 18, 16. New King James, it says, <clears throat> A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. The New Living Translation says, Giving a gift can open doors. It gives access to important people. The, the NIV says, a gift opens the way and ushers the giver into the presence of the great. Now, I've always thought that that, was, that gift there was talking about my abilities, you know, my ability. And you can translate it at that. But I got to study in this passage of scripture when I was preparing this message and I looked up the word gift. And it was one of those, I can't believe I'm that dumb moments. And when you look up the definition of the word gift in this passage of scripture, it simply means this, that that you presently have to give away. That that you presently have to give away. Now, I'm thinking about my garage right now because it's full of stuff that I need to give away. But each one of us have something in our life right now that we can gift someone, that we can give to someone. It's going to be different with each of us. It might be an ability. It might be something else. But when we get interested in gifting, it's amazing what that will do based on the promise of Proverbs 18, 16. It says that it's going to usher us into the presence of the great. It says that it's going to make room for us. It says that it's going to do all manner of things for us. But it won't happen until we get on purpose and take that gift and give it to someone. The problem with the gifts that you and I have so many times is this, is that we devalue them. We devalue them. And listen, what you have in your life presently that you could give away that might be of little or no value to you, it might be of significant value to someone else. And we should not allow ourselves to judge the gifts that God has given us. We should be willing and ready to give that gift. Now, I shared this message a while back in a conference I was speaking, and a few weeks after that conference, I got an email from a lady who was there. And she told me a story. She said, your message about dream acceleration really meant something to me. She said, and we had a, a, a neighbor who just moved into the, our neighborhood who immigrated from another country, a different culture. And I had heard that her mother had passed away. And I wanted to do something to express my condolences to this family. And she said, immediately I started judging the gift that I had. And I immediately went back to your message and to the encouragement that you gave me to not judge my gift. 
And she said, the only thing that I had that I could give her was I could bake her a loaf of bread. And she said, I baked her a loaf of bread. And I went down to my neighbor's house and I knocked on the door and I expressed my condolences and I said, I have a gift for you. It's not much, but I'd like to give it to you. I baked you this loaf of bread and she gave it to the lady. And she began to weep and weep and weep. And she said to the lady, she said, you, you know, you'll have no way of knowing this, but this loaf of bread reminds me of my mother. And one regret I have is that my mom never taught me how to bake bread. And all she did was say, ma'am, may I teach you how to bake bread? That gift made room and opened a door and created an opportunity and put her in the presence of someone that God loves and values that's a great person. But only because she was willing to give it and she was willing to not allow herself to judge and devalue it. You have great things in your life. You have a great wealth of experience in your life. And someone is longing for you to see something in them that is of value. I'm convinced that if we would, if we would allow ourselves to be overcome with the spirit of prophecy, which is the testimony of Jesus, and we would live our life in public looking for the good that God sees in every person, and finding that good in them and speaking to that good, that gift would open up hearts in an unbelievable fashion. There's a lady who, uh, her gift, she had devalued it to the fact and said, nobody wants my gift. But one day she overcame and she offered her gift. Now, her gift was she had one seat in a beat-up old Ford station wagon. Now, I have to explain what station wagons are to the young people in the room. <laughs> That's what Clark Griswold drives in those vacation movies, okay? So, big, long, green, wood grain on the side, you know, kind of thing. But she had one seat. She had her husband, her five kids, and one extra seat in her station wagon. And you know what she did? She offered to take somebody to church. And she, they accepted. They accepted the invitation and came to church. And then a few weeks later, she, she had offered it to this lady to come to church. She was a single mom. And she offered to bring her severely hung over from the night before, still drunk ex-husband to ride in the dirty, beat-up old station wagon with five kids. They put him in a seat in the back looking out the back window. <laughs> and, he, and he came and he accepted it. Those of you who know my story know that was me and Sherry. And it was all because somebody said, I don't care if I got five screaming kids in the car. I don't care if my car is all beat up and dirty. I still got this one gift that I can give away. And it might be the thing that opens up a door, that opens up a significant door, that opens up somebody's heart. It causes somebody to say, you know what? That's what I've been looking for. That's the gift that I've been looking for. Now, every one of you, you have a gift right now in your life, something that you can presently give away. And the Bible gives you the absolute promise it's going to open a door. It's going to make room. It's going to cause influence. But we have to give it. So if you want your dreams to accelerate, what do you do? Dreams are always about the family. What do you do? You use your gift. What's your gift? That that you presently have to give away. What don't you do with your gift? You don't judge it. You don't devalue it. You give it. And so when you leave here today, I want you right now, I want you to just close your eyes. I want you to, I want you to get a picture of your gift. 
And I know some of you are struggling with unbelief right now. Don't. Just shut it off. But just get a picture of what it is that you have. Maybe, maybe for some of you it's something significant. Maybe for some of you it's a smile, a kind word, understanding. Maybe for some of you, you need to invite somebody over. You need to get involved in somebody's life. You need to make room in your life for someone else so that you can be interested. I want you to get that picture in your mind. And let's just lift up one hand. Just lift up one hand and say, Lord, I give this to you. Just say it, Lord, I give this to you. Open a door. Make room. Create influence. But I'm willing to give it. And I release it. And I won't judge it. And I give it to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've been talking about the family. And... Uh, I'm big on the family. And we got such a great family. Not just me and Sherry, but, you know, we've been in church 40 years, and I'm pretty hot on the church. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty big on it because I think it, that God's pretty big on it. As long as it's not full of a bunch of knuckleheads. But uh, then we'll do it. That's another sermon. It's the greatest thing there is to have a family of people around you that can care and you can do life with. Right. And one of the things that I have, and I, I talked about this earlier, um, I don't have disposable relationships. Right. It's like if you're my friend, you're my friend all the time, even when you're having a serious attack of stupid you're my friend and I love I love that about the church the church is a place where we should be able to go and be safe with all our junk it should be a place where there's no masks where there's no hiding where we can open up ourselves and it's not I just have to be honest with you, it's not safe. You know, if I have a problem, the last place I'm coming is to church and telling anybody about it. <laughs> but I, but I, have a, I have a vision that we can create a place that's like that. Yes, sir. I, I have a vision that we can open up, you know, and all it is is that we're afraid. We're just bound by fear. But this is a great family. It's a wonderful family with a wonderful father. The best. And uh, and maybe you're like, well, man, I don't know. I'm not part of that family. Well, that's why Jesus said, you know, it's just like any other family. In order to get into this family, you have to be born into this family. And Jesus came so that all of us, all y'all, right, the whole earth, everyone could be included if they will. If they desired to be it. And he said it like this. He said, you must be born again. And it doesn't matter what you've been through, where you came from, what you've experienced, what your life has been like. Jesus says, you can be born again. And you can be not a better you. You can be a new you. Because when we're born again, we're recreated. We're not like cleaned up. We're made new. We're actually literally, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. That word creature there means a species that previously did not exist. We're a new creature. We're made new. We have a new, we have a new family. We have a new nature. We had this sin nature where we, you know, it was, for me, it was like really easy to mess things up. You know, I could find trouble anywhere. But when I came to Jesus, all of a sudden I had this new nature because he took my sin nature out of me and gave me a righteous nature. And so all of a sudden I had a desire for the things that were righteous instead of for the things that were unrighteous. 
He gives us this new genetic inside of us so that we're connected to God. The law of God's written on our heart and we just have this intuitive nature of who we are and what he made us to be. And as we grow and as we experience more of his presence, the better it becomes. But it starts with us being born again. And you might be here today and you might say, I have not been born again. Or you might say, you know, I don't know if I've been born again. And I understand that because we all have doubts. But today, I want to give you the opportunity to respond to God, to respond to your Father and say, Father, I want to be born again. I want to know that I have been born again, that I have received what you have for me and what Jesus came to accomplish for my life. I want to give you that opportunity. You know, one of the things I love about the Lord is he never makes stuff difficult. He always makes it easy. People say, well, there's many paths to God. Well, no. He said there's one. And you know why he said that? So that we couldn't screw it up. So it would be, we have this one, we have one thing that we need to do. And that's believe that Jesus came to this planet, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, laid down his life on the cross to pay for our sins, received on himself the punishment, the wrath of God for our sins, laid in a tomb, rose from the dead, descended into, into hell and conquered the devil and the grave and everything that was against us, nailed it all to the cross and rose from the dead and is seated at the right hand of God. Now you might say, I have no idea what you're talking about. And if you try to figure that out with your mind, you'll never understand it. Because you have to, you have to believe that in your heart. And the way that you start to believe things in your heart is you simply just say, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust God. So can we do this? Can we just bow our heads and close our eyes and then I'll, I'll be finished in just a minute. But if you're here today and you say, Jimmy, I'm not born again. Or Jimmy, I don't know if I'm born again. Today's your day to connect to the family that you've been longing to experience. To the family that will give you the love that you, that you long for. To the family that will completely understand who you are, how you're made, and show you the reality of the greatness that lives inside of you. So if you're here today and you say, Jimmy, that's me, in just a moment, I want you to lift your hand. If you haven't been born again or if you're not sure if you've been born again, and we're just going to pray together right there where you're at. So if you're here today and you say, Jimmy, that's me. I don't know if I've been born again. I've not been born again. Then right now I want you to lift your hand and we're going to pray together. Thank you, hon. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, we're going to pray together. Thank you, young man. And church, I want you to pray with these folks. I'm just going to lead you that raised your hand in a prayer, and we're all going to pray with you because that's what family does. We do stuff together. So let's just pray. We're just going to talk to our Father, and we're just going to say, Father... I come to you just as I am and I want to be born again. I want to be made new. I want to experience this family. I come to you and I lay myself down. I turn from my sins and I come to Jesus. I ask for your forgiveness and I receive it and I give myself to you I want to be your child I want to know you as my father I want to know Jesus let me pray for these folks that lifted their hands father I just ask right now that this moment 
would be so real in their conscience that they would understand, know, and without a shadow of a doubt, know that they've experienced the reality of your presence in their life, that they've been washed, they've been cleansed, they've been given a new nature, the righteousness of Christ lives in them, that they're a new creature, that they're no longer like they were. And from this moment on, you've empowered them by your spirit. Lord, I pray that they would understand the realities of the kingdom. They'd have a desire for the things of God, a hunger for the word of God, a desire for the house of God. And Lord, that from this day forward, they would know that they have been transformed. In Jesus' name, I thank you. Thank you so much. Let's give everybody a hand. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eric and Andrea and everybody that participated in the weekend with us. And um, thank you so much for being here. I hope that something that I said has inspired you. And I hope that you had a good time in church this morning. Oh, we always do. There you go. Thank you, brother. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah.